Given the reaction to the interview I had with Lord Monckton on Monday on this global warming fiasco has been overwhelming. Remember, there has been no serious attempt by anyone in the Rudd government to explain to us what this is about. The last speech made by the Prime Minister was six months ago on this issue, April 16. We've been told nothing, no economic models, no information on the effect on industry, on unemployment, no documentation on what it will do to the national economy. But as Peter Costello says, when he was introducing the GST, he couldn't walk through a radio or a television door without being asked what that tax would do to every single item that any interviewer could think of. No such questions of the Prime Minister on this carbon tax. I spoke on Monday to Lord Monckton, a former adviser to Margaret Thatcher. And here we are weeks away from the Copenhagen conference in December and Lord Monckton told us for the first time that a treaty will be signed. He's read the treaty. There are 200 pages of it. And he argued that a world government was going to be created. He said that everyone who's going to this so-called climate change meeting in Copenhagen will sign the treaty. And he said one of the central aspects of this will be to transfer wealth from countries of the West, that's us, to third world countries because we've been burning CO2 and they haven't. We've been screwing up on climate, they haven't. And then there'll be a third aspect, aspect of it, and that's to make sure we do what we're told to do, enforcement. Nothing about democracy or voting or balance or nat ballots or national sovereignty. Lord Monckton said to me, and I quote, So at last the communists who piled out of the Berlin Wall and into the environmental movement and took over Greenpeace so that my friends who founded it left within a year because they'd captured it, here they are going to impose a world government on the world. And he made the point of Barack Obama, he said he'll sign anything. Now, of course, Kevin Rudd this week was made vice-captain of the team in Copenhagen, one of three people who's going to persuade everyone at Copenhagen to the virtues of such a treaty which has never, ever been mentioned by Kevin Rudd. Never been debated and never been discussed. Lord Monckton said he'd read the treaty and he said, they're going to do this whether you like it or not. During that interview, Lord Monckton mentioned a paper by Professor Richard Lindzen, L-I-N-D-Z-E-N. Professor Lindzen is an American atmos atmospheric physicist and the Alfred P. Sloan Professor of Meteorology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States. Lord Monckton said of Professor Lindzen, he knows more about the atmosphere than anyone else alive. He'll give you the most honest, straightforward, unpolitical take on the science behind global warming that you'll hear anywhere. Lord Monckton said he's quietly elegant and immensely authoritative. His very recent peer review learned paper directly measuring the relationship between changes in sea surface temperature over the past couple of decades and corresponding changes in outgoing radiation from the top of the atmosphere will, in my untutored opinion, be the single paper that historians will credit with having brought the global warming scare to an end. Professor Richard Lindzen is online from Cambridge, Massachusetts in America. Professor, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for your time. Is this global warming thing a scare? Of course it is. And it was designed to be. Hello? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, uh, you are disappearing. No, it was designed to be from the beginning. So, but we've had scares before, haven't we? I mean, we were told that Halley's Comet was going to clean us out, and in the end you needed high-powered binoculars to even see it. During the Gulf War, we were going to run out of oil, so everyone raced for LPG. Then there was Y2K, and if you had a personal computer, you panicked. Oh, there were more than those. There was the, in this country at least, the threat that fat was going to overtake us. In the 80s, there was the global cooling scare of the 70s. The trouble with all of these things and the evidence, quote, presented for them is that they're a form of uh, what's sometimes called the prosecutor's fallacy. In the case of global warming, uh, the example I like to use is let, let's say you're walking down the street and there's a dirt patch and you kick the dirt you cause an indentation and a rock happens to fall into it and another person comes and trips on the rock, falls into still another person who's carrying a box of carton of eggs. The eggs fall and break and then you find some broken eggs and you conclude that the first person must have kicked up dirt. The <laughs> odds of that are almost zero as are most of these scares. Brilliant.
<laughs> well, look, our Prime Minister says the cost of inaction on climate change will be much greater than the cost of taking action now, and he says it is the great moral challenge of our time. Yeah, I mean, it must make him feel very good to have such a challenge when perhaps there are none others that he sees himself <laughs> facing, but frankly, he's doing exactly estimating the cost on the basis of the evidence of the broken eggs. Yeah, I mean, he's not a scientist or whatever, but he says... He says, he's scaring the tripe out of Australians, if we don't do anything, the Murray-Darling Basin will be barren in Australia, the Barrier Reef will be destroyed, skiing in Australia will be a thing of the past, our economic output will decline by 4.8% annually, real wages will be slashed by 7.8%. I mean, that's being said by a Professor Garno, who's the expert advising the Prime Minister on all of this. And he knows, Garno knows no science, he's an economist, and he's trying to mimic... Uh Stern in the UK because he sees all the rewards that Stern has gotten for making similar claims. Yeah. The Archbishop of Canterbury said billions of deaths will result from global warming. Um, ask him how. <laughs> yes, ask him how. So just... I mean, how many... I don't know how it is in Australia, but, you know, here in New England, I don't know of anyone who retires to Alaska but I know lots of people who choose to go to warmer areas. That's true, that's true. But let me just ask you the base question, because we're all dumbbells on the science side. Do carbon dioxide... Well, sorry, is there such a thing as global warming? Of course there is, and there's global cooling, and the temperature yep. is always changing. Yep, always changing.